This podcast is for informational and educational purposes only and is not to be considered medical advice for any particular patient. Clinicians must rely on their own informed clinical judgments when making recommendations for their patients. Patients in need of medical advice should consult their personal health care provider. From UPMC Children's Hospital of Pittsburgh, welcome to That's Pediatrics. I'm one of your hosts, John Williams, Chief of the Infectious Diseases Division and Director of the Institute for Infection, Inflammation, and Immunity in Children. And I'm Steph Dewar, Vice Chair of Clinical Affairs, Co-Director of the Pediatric Residency Training Program, and a member of the Division of Pediatric Hospital Medicine. We're happy to welcome this morning Dr. Jerry Vockley, who is a member of our Division of Medical Genetics. He's also a professor of pediatrics at the University of Pittsburgh School of Medicine and a professor of human genetics at the Pitt Graduate School of Public Health. Here at Children's, he directs an active research program on inherited disorders of energy and protein metabolism, focused on both understanding the genetic causes of these disorders and developing new treatments for them. He has been funded by the National Institutes of Health for several decades and currently holds three NIH research grants. Dr. Vockley, welcome to That's Pediatrics. Thanks, Dr. Dewar. And if I can just add that I also direct the Center for Rare Disease Therapy here at Children's Hospital, a, a very important uh, clinical mm -hmm. effort that focuses on bringing the research that we're doing to clinical practice. Excellent. So I'm sure our listeners are wondering what it is that's happening here at Children's or what information that might be helpful for them um, as far as genetics goes in their daily practice. Well, I thought I'd focus today on uh, newborn screening. Um, this is, this is a, quite a, a complicated topic because uh, it's not a single program, it's 50 programs. Every state runs their own newborn screening program, and so it differs from from uh, from from state to state. Uh, it, it's uh, I, I I think useful uh, to review uh, what newborn screening is, uh, why we do it, and uh, then I can talk a little bit about uh, sort of national norms uh, and how that gets implemented at the state level. Yeah, that sounds great. It's something I don't really know much about, except that uh, it happens, and we learn things from it, but how do things make it onto the newborn screen, and why is it so different state to state? Sure. Well, newborn screening is, is uh, uh, above and uh, uh, everything, uh, a, a, a public health initiative. So keep in mind that the goal is not to identify um, every possible disease, nor is it to say we're going to have 100% accuracy in every newborn screening test that comes out there. Um, the goal is to look um, for diseases where early identification um, makes a difference. Uh, we, we, we have the technology to readily identify it, uh, and then we can do something about it once it's identified. Uh, and that doing so um, Makes uh, is it makes a difference in the outcome as compared to identifying it uh, symptomatically uh, later in life. Uh, newborn screening started with PKU, phenylketonuria, a disorder of amino acid metabolism, and it was recognized um, now uh, what about 70, 80 years ago um, that that if you um, treated this disease, which untreated is devastating neurodevelopmental um, uh, uh, disorder with essentially no intellectual development, terrible um, uh, behavioral issues, and a really um, difficult to manage movement disorder. And, and if you identify the first patient in the family and then treat the second, i.e. you identify the next baby as being affected early on, you can completely reverse that or, or avoid the, the, uh, those, those symptoms uh, by, by placing the, 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 the baby on a low phenylalanine uh, diet. Um, and that was the beginning of newborn screening. Fifty years ago, um, the state of Massachusetts began a program uh, to, to screen for um, PKU at, at birth. 
uh, and it and it rapidly um, went across uh, the country. We're fortunate here in Pennsylvania and in Pittsburgh uh, because uh, Dr. Ed Naylor um, is, is, a, is a pioneer in newborn screening um, and uh, a professor now emeritus uh, uh, of, of the University of Pittsburgh. The technology for newborn screening has changed over the decades, um, but the goal really hasn't. Um, and, uh, and, and, and so uh, we're, we're, we're now up to uh, screening, depending on the state, uh, anywhere between 30 and 50 diseases uh, in, the, in the newborn um, period. Well, I will reveal, Jerry, that you and I may be of a similar clinical genre. Um, I did my medical school in Pennsylvania, my residency training in Florida, my early practice in Ohio, and then came to Pennsylvania. And remember a time, you know, where we only screened for four or five diseases, um, one of which we didn't screen for was um, sickle cell disease. And it was really a potentially devastating diagnosis if it was missed. Um, so I think it's astounding. That number of diseases you just said is astounding to me as somebody who has practiced for more than several decades. So um, I appreciate the changes. Is there yeah, anything? And, and, and the technology is, 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 is really the reason. Um, uh, the, I, I mentioned Dr. Naylor, Naylor and, and, and one of the things um, that, that he was responsible for was developing um, uh, a, a technology or implementing it in newborn screening uh, that, that uh, is now used in all 50 states. It's a technology called mass spectrometry or tandem mass spec. And what it does is you can take these little um, uh, blood spots that, that, that people still tend to call the PKU test. Uh, but you take a little blood, uh, little little pinprick from on the on the baby's heel, and you spot it on these blood cards, uh, filter papers, and you send it into the to the state. You can take a, a paper punch, just the you know the things you use for your kids in grade school. Um, you punch a little a little uh, 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 disc of blood, and you can extract enough blood from that uh, that disc to do a whole bunch of these tests. In the case of mass spec. Um, uh, the, the, uh, the, 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 the test I, identifies dozens of different uh, chemicals, metabolites, that are characteristic of these various metabolic disorders, and, and, and that test alone um, adds a couple of dozen uh, t uh, disorders uh, to, the, uh, to the newborn screen. Uh, and that's, uh, that's why the, 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 the number uh, is, uh, is, is, is so high. In addition to those disorders, uh, you, you mentioned the, 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 the relatively small handful that was present on the newborn screening for, for probably about three decades before we had this, vast, this big expansion. Um, those are individual tests that are the, where, where uh, you, you, you design one test, you get one blood spot, and you run that test, and, and, uh, and you report it out. And those are diseases like um, PKU, galactosemia, uh, congenital hypothyroidism, uh, congenital adrenal hyperplasia, now sickle cell disease and hemoglobinopathies in general. Um, and, uh, and, and, and so we, we still have those on the screen. Um, but we've, we've moved to now um, uh, a, a, a next generation of uh, screening where we're doing some testing that is uh, uh, PCR-based um, purely molecular, uh, looking, for example, for, uh, and John, you would appreciate this, uh, um, a severe combined immune deficiency, SCID. Um, the, that's a, that's a, a molecular test looking for these, these DNA circles called TREX that the white blood cells kick out as their, uh, uh, the, the, the B cells as they're making antibodies. And if those TREX aren't, aren't identifiable in, in uh, white blood cells from newborn uh, screening blood spots, uh, you have a severe combined immune deficiency. Yeah, you know, it's really incredible how the technology has expanded this list. And like staff, I remember, you know, many of these things coming on board. And that last one, as you remember, it, it, it is really of particular interest to me as an infectious disease doctor, because historically, uh, you know, a lot of babies with SCID, severe combined immune deficiency, would present in extremis or would only be diagnosed a after they had died. So it's remarkable now because so many of those kids uh, can be treated with 
a stem cell transplant. We discussed that with another guest on this podcast, Paul Schabold. So I was really struck by one thing you said, that it varies state to state. Why is that? Why is the repertoire of newborn screening we do different in different states? Well, so this, now you have to go back to, 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 to the Constitution, right? And, and, and there's a line in there that says, anything that's not here is the responsibility of the states. Um, and that's really where it starts. Um, so public health um, is, 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 is um, and, and newborn screening are not mentioned in the, in the Constitution, and the states have all developed these very robust departments of public health to administer to the, the needs of their population on a population basis. Um, and uh, they took on newborn screening from the beginning and, and, uh, um, uh, uh, and, and, and developed it. But because there, there, there wasn't uh, any sort of national guidance on what should be on there, it, it varied uh, greatly from, from state to state. For example, the tandem mass spec in, in Pennsylvania um, has, has been um, uh, the, the norm for, what, probably 25 years now because of the, 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 the role of uh, Dr. Naylor in, in, uh, in uh, developing the technology and advancing it. So, so we've... So we've got a long history of following these patients from newborn now to, uh, to adulthood. Um, now, uh, what, about 20 years ago, 15 um, maybe, um, the, the, the field recognized this disparity. If you were in Pennsylvania, you got screened for 30 things. If you were in West Virginia, you got screened for four. And, and uh, you know, you can step across the line and be uh, in one state or the other. Uh, and uh, uh, the uh, HRSA put together uh, a national panel um, uh, that that uh, was uh, tasked at reviewing newborn screening tests that were out there um, and deciding uh, which ones made sense. So they do it on an, ev an evidence-based um, analysis of what was out there and uh, what was effective, uh, and and came up with what was called. Uh, the Recommended Universal Screening Panel, or the RUSP. Um, and that has become the de facto national standard. Many states explicitly tie their newborn screening programs to the RUSP. Um, and so if one is, uh, the new disease is added to the RUSP, it gets um, uh, uh, automatically added to the state's uh, screening program. Here in Pennsylvania, we don't have an automatic um, uh, a trigger for that, uh, but but there is a uh, a newborn screening technical advisory board, uh, which I used to chair for many years. That that looks at the RUSP and looks at the the uh, uh, recommendations of that national panel, which I also happened to serve on for many years, um, and 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 try to keep them um, in in sync. Uh, so now that that uh, everything that is on the RUSP. Um, uh, is 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 uh, is in fact screened for um, in all states, uh, but many states uh, have have uh, active uh, programs that are are, are go uh, go at a, above and and, and beyond um, what is recommended in the RUSP. For example, there are a number now of lysosomal storage diseases that are being um, uh, added to the newborn screen in 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 many states. Um, and uh, the, the, that, that's, uh, th those sort of exceed the RUSP uh, uh, recommendations, and uh, you can almost view them as being sort of public health experiments. Uh, uh, they're, 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 they're done on newborns. Newborns come in for treatment, and you get a chance to see whether those, those babies do better in, in screening states uh, than, in, than in other states. Wow, what a remarkable uh, aspect of care that is and what a terrific advance for children. And I just want the record to show that on the podcast, Dr. Jerry Vikley has just name-checked the Constitution. So there's, ah. your, there's your civics lesson for today. Well, I, I do appreciate you doing that, Jerry, because it is very timely in the times that we're living uh, with, you know, who has... Um, the responsibility and authority to make these kinds of decisions, not just about newborn screening, but perhaps about changing the way we operate in the midst of this current COVID epidemic. So it's, um, 
it's good for all of us to be aware of how we govern ourselves. And um, I find it very, very timely that you brought that up. I'm wondering if we could pivot um, the conversation a little bit um, away from newborn screening, if that's okay, and and talk a little bit about gene therapy and, and what, what's new in that horizon. Sure. I, 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 maybe I'll, I'll, I'll delay that for one last comment on newborn screening, which is just to remind people um, that that newborn screening is 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 a program um, that the uh, uh, that that is only partially um, uh, 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 completed when you, once you make the diagnosis. Uh, uh, remember all of those other parts that I that I mentioned, which is that that, that you have to make a difference. You have to provide uh, therapy. So um, in in many states, uh, there 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 are uh, programs. Uh, that are tied to the newborn screen that that also provide services uh, for for uh, for those individuals. Many times, there's only one or there are only one or two uh, centers in a state that can treat them, and so those centers, uh, one one of which is Children's Hospital of Pittsburgh, um, uh, get get uh, uh, some support from the state uh, to, to to help uh, continue to to uh, uh, treat those patients. But it's really important not to just Say we're going to screen for something and then dump them into the laps of the pediatricians uh, or the poor geneticists uh, who are sitting there saying, "Well, what am I going to do? How am I supposed to? How am I supposed to treat this?" So I think well, that's I, an important aspect of uh, yeah, the board. I appreciate you pointing that out because um, if you're out in a in a private practice, practice, it's good to know where your resources are when you have those. Um, abnormal screens come back and, and to understand what the next steps are and what the timeliness of that needs to be. So I appreciate you mentioning that, but it is wonderful to be here at Children's because we do have those supports available uh, for those patients who subsequently have those diagnoses. Yep, I agree. So now to pivot to, uh, to, to genetic testing, or rather uh, gene therapy. Um, uh, which which uh, uh, is, is is something I'm I'm delighted to be able to spend a little time talking about it because um, for probably the last uh, 25 years of of, of my career, uh, people have said gene therapy is just around the corner. It's just around the corner, five years away, um, and uh, and and even five years ago, it really didn't look like it was going to be five years. Uh, away, uh, but 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 believe it or not, it's here, um, and and this is this is an incredibly exciting uh, development uh, that that uh, really is going to stand not only genetic disease on its head, but but um, uh, uh, any any disease where where delivery of a gene product, i.e., a protein, can um, can make a difference. The the delivery of proteins. Uh, to as immunogens or, or genes as immunogens because they make proteins that can that can um, serve as a as a vaccination. Uh, very very timely now, of course. Uh, the first uh, 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 COVID uh, vaccine to make it to uh, uh, a a uh, a clinical uh, a, a, a phase one clinical trial was not a protein. It was a it was an RNA vaccination that made. Uh, a COVID uh, capsid protein. So this is really, really important, not just for genetics, but uh, but across the across the span. Um, and uh, and uh, this. So so right now, all of these gene therapies um, for for rare genetic disorders are still in clinical trials. There are a couple of gene therapies. You've probably heard of CAR T uh, therapy for for cancers. Uh, those are manipulating a white blood cell taken from a patient, a stem cell, um, uh, putting it back in the patient and using the patient's own immune system to kill their cancer. What we're talking about is different. It's injecting a, um, a, a something that delivers a gene, um, incorporates into a tissue in, in, in a patient's body, um, and then provides them with the missing function um, that that uh, is is part of that uh, genetic disorder. Um, I'll go back to PKU because we started talking about uh, uh, that as the as the, the first disease for for newborn screening. It's also now the first uh, the really um, uh, a metabolic disease, the biochemical genetic disorders that I I, I study and, and treat predominantly. 
um, that's that's coming to uh, that's coming to attention for for gene therapy. Um, the the gene that's that's defective in this disorder, phenylalanine hydroxylase, is is for all intents and purposes only expressed in the liver. Um, and so if you could get um, a uh, a phenylalanine hydroxylase gene back into a patient's liver cells, one that worked, um, you, they would start making PAH protein, and it would it would um, it would potentially fix these patients. Now we know this is true because there have been patients with PKU who have had liver transplants for completely unrelated reasons, and when they're done with their transplant, their PKU is cured. They don't have it anymore. They've got a new liver. That's gene therapy. Well, now what we do is, 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 is you can put the, the gene for these various proteins into um, a, viral a viral vector. This is a non-infectious uh, particle that can get into the cells um, the, the, to deliver the gene, but then not replicate any further. Um, and uh, uh, we, we have an active gene therapy trial for uh, PKU uh, and uh, in in the here children's it's a national trial sponsored by a um, a, a pharmaceutical company that that we've helped um, develop the, the this therapy and um, and and it 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 looks pretty promising and gene 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 therapy trials like most pharmaceutical trials are are slow and painstaking and you have to start with low doses and work up and and with the most Recent dose, it looks like um, the 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 individuals' uh, phenylalanine levels are coming back down into the normal range. There are a couple of other disorders: uh, ornithine transcarbamylase deficiency, which is a urea cycle defect that leads to devastating hyperaminemia in patients. And right now, the the, the therapy for it is liver transplant. Well, gene therapy seems to be helping those patients. Uh, Glycogen storage disease, a disorder where patients can fast without becoming hypoglycemic. Uh, uh, gene therapy um, is is uh, is fixing the hypoglycemia in those uh, in those uh, patients. So we literally have um, I don't know the last time I call I, I counted probably somewhere uh, between 10 and 15 gene therapy trials that are either uh, started um, or soon to start. Um, here at Children's, ranging from some of the diseases that I've already talked about to things like um, the lysosomal storage diseases that I men mentioned as part of uh, newborn screening, uh, and it's a real exciting time. Uh, the, the, these, these gene therapy trials are probably going to take three to five years to run their course, and, and so I can, I, can, I can genuinely say that five years from now we will have gene therapy uh, to, to treat many of these disorders. Well, that's really exciting, Jerry. I mean, that's just amazing. And you also cleverly just laid the groundwork for the sequel, the return of Jerry Vockley, uh, in a couple of years to talk about the results of those trials. But in the last few minutes we have, I'd love to hear your own path of, you know, how did you come to become a pediatric geneticist and be working uh, in this area? Well, it's it's uh, how, how how long do we have? No, um, I, I've always been interested in genetics. I took a genetics course as my in my in my second semester of undergraduate, and I thought this is really cool. I I, I have to I have to do this, and and so uh, I, I I did a lot of uh, genetic research as an undergraduate. Um, I was was uh, unsure for a while whether I was even going to do an MD because I, I really wanted to do the basic science research. Um, and was fortunate to stumble into one of these new, M then new MD PhD programs, the Medical Scientist Training Program, uh, at the University of Pennsylvania, um, and did a PhD in genetics uh, at at the same time as uh, as I as I uh, uh, did my my uh, my my MD, um, and I I realized uh, through my my medical school courses that there was actually this discipline of medical genetics, uh, a medical specialty focused on treating these disorders, um, and uh, uh, the, 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 the rest was, was uh, just a matter of time. Um, I, I did a pediatric residency where I managed to convince the uh, program director of the residency, Steph, you can plug your ears now, 
um, who was a medical geneticist, and, and uh, she just let me uh, uh, do genetics for everything. So I did my continuity clinic in genetics. Remember, this was a long time ago in a universe far away, so we got away with a lot more in training back then. Um, and uh, went, went, to, uh, went to Yale, uh, continued my research uh, uh, and, and, uh, and, and, my, and my clinical training and, and uh, uh, have been doing that ever since. Got my, my mother insisted on calling my first real job at the Mayo Clinic uh, on faculty there uh, and helped uh, build a department of, of, uh, of uh, genetics. And uh, what, now 15 years ago, um, when uh, then chair of the department, David Perlmutter, called me and, and, and asked if I would be uh, interested in, in uh, uh, starting a, a division of genetics here at uh, Children's, uh, it, was, uh, it was an offer that was uh, too, good to, too good to refuse. I, I returned to my roots because, in fact, I'm a native Pittsburgh. Well, as one yinzer to another, that was a great story of where you came from and where you went and came back to. And I, and I really appreciate, um, you know, having you here as a valued colleague, although I will shout back to your experience in continuity clinic. You know, we're starting to <laughs> allow those <laughs> types of specialty training in con uh, continuity clinic even now in residency training further along. And so what's old is new again. So it's a... It's I a know. Isn't it great? <laughs> So, so, Jerry, thanks so much for joining us today and talking to us a little bit about what's happening here in the Division of Genetics. And uh, once again, we look forward to having you back in a couple of years to talk more about what's happening. Oh, I'll come back anytime. I've got lots of other stuff to talk about, but uh, would be happy to would be happy to do a follow up on on uh, on on gene therapy when it's appropriate. Uh, that that one's uh, listed. Uh, thanks again, Dr. Vockley, and thanks to our listeners. You can find other episodes of That's Pediatrics on iTunes, Google Play Music, and YouTube. Be sure to subscribe to keep up with new content. Leave us a review and tell us what other topics you'd like our experts to cover. Thanks for listening.